With the rise of open source models and efficient fine tuning methods, it's never been easier to build custom ML solutions. For example, anyone with a single GPU can now fine tune a large language model on their local machine, which is exactly what I did in a previous video of this series. However, since my machine is an M series Mac, which doesn't have an Nvidia GPU, I had to use the free GPU on Google Colab to run that example. This is somewhat disappointing because using Colab's free GPUs is somewhat restrictive and not as convenient as running something on my local machine. That's why in this video, I'm going to share an easy way to fine tune an LLM locally on Mac. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Shah. I make videos about data science and entrepreneurship. And if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing. That's a great no cost way you can support me in all the videos that I make. If you've been keeping up with machine learning over the past decade, then you're probably familiar with NVIDIA and all their different GPUs. It turns out that GPUs are super helpful for machine learning because they can much more efficiently train and run machine learning models than traditional CPUs. They've also demonstrated an ability to take NVIDIA from a hundred billion dollar valuation all the way up to three trillion in the past five years. NVIDIA's dominance of the GPU market has greatly influenced the available open source tools for running and training neural networks. The result of this is that a lot of open source tools work seamlessly with NVIDIA hardware. While this is great for Windows and Linux users, it often leaves Mac users, like me, left sitting on the sidelines. After a failed attempt to locally fine tune Llama 2 on my local machine, my impression was pulling this off is something that would take several hours of effort. That was until I discovered the MLX Python library. MLX is a Python library developed by Apple's machine learning research team for efficiently running matrix operations on Apple Silicon. So we see the documentation here. It's inspired by frameworks like PyTorch, JAX, and ArrayFile. One of the notable differences with MLX is that it allows you to use the unified memory model of these M1 chips. No longer do you have to worry about RAM and VRAM being separate things. M1 chips just have a single memory. So that means means me with my Mac mini M1 2020 with only 16 gigs of memory am capable of fine tuning a large language model locally on my machine. While MLX is a pretty low level framework, it's not going to have high level abstractions for loading and training models like Hugging Face, for example. There is this example implementation of LoRa, which is very readily hackable and adaptable to another use case, which is exactly what I'm going to do here. Similar Similar to the previous QLORA video, here I'm going to fine tune a quantized version of Mistral 7B Instruct to respond to YouTube comments in my likeness. However, instead of using Hugging Face in Google Colab, here I'm going to use the MLX library and my local machine. And again, here are the specs of my machine. It's a Mac Mini M1 from 2020 with only 16 gigabytes of memory. So by today's standards, my machine is hilarious. But despite that, it's still good enough to to implement this fine tuning example. So I've put together some example code and that's available on GitHub. If you go to my YouTube blog repo, go to the LLMs tab. Here we see all the different code and videos and blogs of this series. So now there's a new one called QLORA MLX. So we click on that. What I've done here is I have this notebook that walks through the example code. And then I've taken all the scripts from that MLX example implementation. So I've put them in the scripts folder. And then and here I've prepared data. So this is data of my YouTube comments and I prepared it in this JSON L format, but we won't talk about this right now. I'll talk about it a little later. Okay, so the first step in running this example is to go to the repo and clone it. So I'll copy this URL here. I'll go over to my terminal. Let me zoom in a bit. Okay, so we're gonna clone the repo, git clone. Might take a while. Unfortunately, there's not a way to clone a specific subfolder of a GitHub repo. If you want to download some code from a repo, you have to clone the entire thing. Go to the repo we just cloned, and then the code is in the LLMs subdirectory, and then it's QLORA MLX. So here we see everything. We've got our example code, requirements file, some scripts, some data, and a readme. Okay, so I cloned the repo and I navigated to this folder. So now let's create a Python environment that allows us to run the code. So here I'll 
create a new virtual environment called MLX-ENV, and then I'll activate this environment. So this is how you do it in Bash and ZSH, and I guess every Mac user uses this. So this is how you'll activate the environment. All right, so now you can see we're in this MLX-ENV environment, but the only thing in here is pip. So you see you do pip list, all there is is pip. So let's install all the required libraries. So we can just do the pip install dash requirements.txt, and this will install everything. While that's happening, we can look at what is in that. So here we have MLX, we have MLX underscore LM. So this is a library built on top of MLX, specifically for large language models. Also, we have the transformers library and NumPy. And then finally, since I wrote the code in a Jupyter notebook, we'll install Jupyter Lab and IPy widgets. Okay, so we installed all the requirements. And if you run into trouble in the installation step, so here's some important notes from MLX's documentation. First and foremost, you need the M series chip. Like that's the whole point of this video and this library. The second is that you are using a native Python that's greater than or equal to 3.8. So I think here I'm using 3.12. If I just do this, yeah, so I'm using 3.12.2. Then you have to have at least Mac OS 13.5, but they recommend that you have Mac OS 14, which is what I'm running on my machine right now. So now that we've cloned the repo and we set up our environment, let's run through the example code. So to do that, we'll do Jupyter Lab. Okay, so here we've got the example code, video link and blog link coming soon because I'm making it right now. And then we're gonna zoom in because it's probably tiny on your screen. All right, so MLX fine tuning, we're gonna do some imports. So we're gonna import sub process because all the example code that we're hacking runs from the command line. And so sub process allows us to run terminal commands through Python. And then here I'm importing the MLX LM library to run inference on a model a little later. So I defined some helper functions here. They're not super important right now. So I'll just come back to them as we encounter them in the code. And then this is an optional step. That example code from MLX comes with this convert.py script, which is capable of taking any model from the hugging face hub and converting it into the proper MLX format and additionally quantizing it. So I actually did this for Mistral 7B Instruct version 0.2. And then there's this argument that you can pass that will push the model to the MLX community. So I guess that's worth calling out right now. MLX has this page on Hugging Face. Here are several MLX compatible models, many of which are quantized. So there's Google Gemma, Mistral, Quen, Code Gemma, Llama 3, Phi 3, Whisper, Llama 3.1 even. So this page seems pretty active and basically any model that you would want to fine tune is probably already available here. And if it's not, you can simply just go find the model that you want to use in MLX. Let's go to Mistral AI. I'll go to Mistral 7B Instruct. So this is the one I used. Given this hugging face model path, we can convert it to the MLX format and quantize it using this convert.py script. So there was this typo, so I had to add this quantize flag. So what this will do is grab the hugging face model, convert it to the MLX format, and this quantize flag converts into four bit quantization. So I actually didn't run the command yet. So you could run this command using this sub process module, but I found it's better to just print the command like this and copy paste it into the terminal. Because when you run these shell commands in a Jupyter notebook, you don't see the same like progress metrics that you would normally. And this will actually save a MLX version of that model on your local machine that you can run for inference and fine tuning. Since here, we're gonna use a model that's already available on the Hugging Face Hub. Here's the model card for it. We can just skip this quantize model step. And so here what's happening is I'm gonna build the prompt that is defined here. So again, here we're creating a YouTube comment responder. What this model will do is you'll pass in a comment and it'll respond to that comment, hopefully in my likeness. So for this example, I'm not just gonna pass the raw comment into the model itself for inference. I have actually constructed this prompt, which is the same prompt that we saw in the previous QLora example to help the model generate better responses. I created a Lambda function for this, defined this instruction string, and then did some string manipulation to incorporate the comment into it dynamically. The result of that is this prompt builder Lambda function, which takes in the comment. And so here we're just doing a very boring comment. Great content, thank you. And then we'll define the max number of tokens. And then here we're going to use the MLX LM library 
library to do inference. So the syntax looks very similar to Hugging Face, which is pretty convenient if you're comfortable with Hugging Face already. So here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna load in the model. So this is that same quantized model. And then we're gonna have the model generate a response. So we pass in the model, the tokenizer, which was loaded automatically, the prompt that we defined using our prompt builder, the max number of tokens, which I set to 140, and then I put verbose equal to true. Okay, so we can take a look at the prompt here, which is all this stuff. I'm not gonna read all this. You can read it if you like, but this is just to help nudge the model in the right direction. Then we have this please respond to the following comment. And this is the comment that we spliced in using that prompt builder lambda function. And then down here is the model's response. So this is the raw quantized model, no fine tuning whatsoever. And this is the response. Well, first and foremost, it puts SHA GPT in the wrong place. This is supposed to be at the end of the response, not at the beginning, but it says, thank you for your kind words. I'm glad you found the content helpful and enjoyable. If you have any specific questions or topics you'd like me to cover in more detail, please feel free to ask. I would never respond to a, a comment like this. This is something we've seen in the previous fine tuning videos where the unfine tuned responses tend to be pretty verbose. And when I respond to comments or really any kind of communication, I try to keep it as concise as possible. So this is very different than something I'd actually write in response to a comment. So let's see how we can fine tune this model to generate responses that sound a lot more like me. Here again, we're going to use one of the scripts from that MLX examples repo. And I'm going to construct the command in the same way. So I put everything in a list. And the reason I have it in a list is because that's how you can run these terminal commands in Python. You'll pass it in as a list to the subprocess module. But I realized that even with this fancy helper function that ChatGPT wrote me to continuously print outputs from a terminal command, it still wasn't printing the loss during training. So I actually found an alternative strategy to be more helpful, which is to just take this command variable here and to translate it into a string that I can copy and paste into my terminal. And so this construct shell command is just a pretty simple helper function up here that's just doing some basic string manipulation to convert this list into a string. What I'll do is I'll copy this string and then we can go over to terminal and then I'll paste the command here. Okay, so walking through this a little bit, I'll try to zoom in even more. Hopefully that's legible. We're running a Python script, so that's what this is. The Python script we're running is called LoRa and it's in this scripts subdirectory. And then we're just gonna define the parameters for training. So here we're specifying the model, which is that four bit version of Mistral 7B instruct. We have this train flag because we're gonna run training. We're gonna set the number of iterations. So we're gonna do 100 iterations. That means it's gonna run through 100 batches and the default batch size is four. Next is steps per eval. So this is the number of batches that the training will run through before computing the validation loss. So I set it to 10, which is the same as the number of steps per training loss evaluation. The val batches is the number of examples to include in the validation loss calculation. Setting it to negative one goes through everything in the validation data set. And here that's only 10 examples. Next, we set the learning rate at one to the minus five, which is actually the same as the default, but I have it explicitly written here because I was playing around with this. I probably ran this a dozen different times trying to find the best hyperparameters. And then LoRa layers 16, which is also the default parameter. But I went through a lot of iterations to just end up coming back to the default. And then finally, we've used this test flag, which computes the test loss at the end of training. I guess before we run this, it's worth talking about the data that we're using here. We have three data sets. So we have this train.json-l, test.json-l, and valid JSON-l. The way I make these data sets are here in this Jupyter Notebook, also available on the GitHub. What I'm doing here is I'm taking a CSV file of YouTube comments and responses, which looks like this. So I've got 70 comments. These are real comments and 70 real responses from me. And so this is the way I'm going to train the model to respond to comments in my likeness. And the way I do the train test validation split is I have 50 examples for training, 10 examples for testing, and 10 examples for validation. I won't walk through this code because I did it in the QLora video and I did a similar thing for the OpenAI fine tuning API video. But if you're curious about how I'm doing the data preparation, feel free to check this out. We're using the same prompt in the training data as I used at inference in the example code we just saw. Very similar 
similar strategy. The JSONL format, if you're familiar with Python, is essentially a list of dictionaries. So a dictionary is a set of key value pairs, and a list is just a sequence, a collection of elements. JSONL is just going to be a collection of these key value pairs, where each key value pair, each dictionary, consists of one key and one value. So super simple. The key is text and the value is the example that you want to use to train or evaluate the language model. Notice that this contains the instructions essentially of the model. This bit is the comment, the real comment from the user, and then it ends with this instruction token. And then here's the real response from me. So all of these are packed together to form the example. And we have 70 of these and 50 are going toward training, 10 are going for testing and 10 are going for validation. Validation. So here I randomly select examples for testing and validation, and then I just write everything to these JSONL files. So hopefully this example code is easy for you to follow and hack and adapt for your own use case. And if you get stuck, you know, feel free to drop a comment or reach out. I'm happy to help try to get you unstuck. Okay, so that brief aside was the data preparation. Now let's go into training. So I actually haven't done this while running OBS, so my computer might blow up if I do this. So I've got Activity Monitor, and it's not looking looking great because OBS is already using a gig of memory. And when I was running this, the fine tuning script was taking like 14 gigabytes of memory. And so I'm going to execute this script. But if my computer blows up and I'm not able to post this video, I'm so sorry. All right, here goes nothing. Nothing has blown up yet. We'll just keep the activity monitor here so we can monitor the memory pressure. So we see that the fine tuning script is taking about 10 gigabytes of memory. There's this other Python script, which I guess is the Jupyter Notebook, taking up four gigabytes of memory. And then we got OBS here taking up one gigabyte of memory. So when I was doing this for real, I was basically doing nothing else on my machine. I was just allowing as much memory as possible to be dedicated to the fine tuning script. But here it seems like the MLX library is handling it pretty well. You know, it seems to just dynamically adapt to however much memory is available. Okay, so it computed the val loss. I don't think anything's gonna blow up, so that's great. And kudos to Apple and their ML research team for writing a good software library. But I do think since less memory is being allocated to this compared to just not running anything else on my machine, this is gonna take a lot longer to run. Before, when I was just allowing the training to run all by itself, I didn't have the Jupyter Notebook running either. This was hitting like 14 gigabytes of memory, 13 to 14 or something, got kind of close to 13 there. And it took about like 15 or 20 minutes to fine tune the model with the hyperparameters shown here, batch size of four, and has 50 training examples. So I'm not going to sit here for 20 minutes to wait for this to run because I've already done this and I can show you the finished product. Once again, like those cooking shows where they show you how to prepare the food and put it in the oven. And then magically they had the lasagna that they made last night and they're going to eat it in front of us. Okay, so here's me eating the lasagna. We're going to quit out of this process, killed that. And then what we can do is to run inference with the fine tuned model. So this doesn't have the adapter file. So what I'll do is open up a new one of these. Maybe I'll do this in private. Once training is done, so we'll say 20 minutes goes by, you go get a sandwich or something while this is running. This adapters.npz file will appear in the repository. These are the low raw weights learned during training. Once that is here, we can continue with the Jupyter Notebook and we'll use these adapters to run inference again. So this will be our fine tuned model. So we're going to run it in a similar way, but instead of printing a command and copy pasting it into the terminal here, we can just run it in the notebook because there's really not much to see. You can see that it failed because the adapters file wasn't there. But now that it's here, we can run this again. So now it loaded the pre-trained model. It passed in in the prompt and the prompt is including the comment, which is just that simple, great content, thank you. And then we have the response from Shaw GPT. Glad you enjoyed it, smiley face, Shaw GPT. So this is much more aligned with something I would actually say to a short comment like this. Going back, this long and poorly formatted comment is not what we want, but just after 50 training examples, we see that the model is noticeably responding in a different way. And then we can even run this a few times 
to see what else it comes up with. Glad you liked it. So I guess it'll probably keep generating responses that are similar to that. Yeah, glad you're here, happy to help. Okay, yeah, these are great. These are things that I have said in comments, so it's doing a good job. But that's a really easy comment to respond to. Let's try a different comment. So here's a harder one that I think this is more recent. I don't know. This is not in the training data or anything. So let's see how Shaw GPT MLX handles this one. So the comment is, I discovered your channel yesterday and I'm hooked. Great job. It would be nice to see a video of fine tuning Shaw GPT using Hugging Face. I saw a video you running it on Google Collapse 7B. Any chance of doing a video on your laptop, Mac, or using Hugging Face Spaces? So that's exactly what this video is. Let's see what Shaw GPT thinks. Hi, thanks for your kind words. Sure thing. I'll do a video about fine tuning HF versions on Shaw GPT on my Mac. Uh, then it has this YouTube link. Hope it helps Shaw GPT. Okay, so let's see what this takes us to. Ah, uh, the video doesn't exist. Probably because I'm making the video. It'd be really crazy if when I post this video, <laughs> this becomes the URL. You know, it's responding appropriately. You know, it's like thanking them. It's pretty short. It puts Shaw GPT at the end. This sentence here doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I'll do a video about fine tuning HF versions of Shaw GPT. So hugging face versions of Shaw GPT on my Mac. Let's see what else it says. So I guess this is kind of hard question to respond to. How would it know what I want to do? Glad to hear it. Glad you found the uh, channel useful. Okay, well, this is a nice response, but it doesn't answer the person's question. So let's try another one. Hey, glad you're enjoying the channel. Okay, refuses to respond. I guess another thing is we can check out the memory spikes during inference. So let's do this one more time. Take a look at the memory pressure. So we see that it kind of goes up a bit. I guess it's opening up another Python instance to run these subprocesses, and it takes up about four gigabytes of of memory. Yeah, glad to hear. So it's refusing to respond to this guy's comment. I think I got lucky when I uploaded this because it had a really good response. Let's see. Glad you enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to doing a fine tuning video on my laptop. I've got a Mac M1 mini that runs the latest version of the HF API. So the great thing about this one is that it's got right that I have an M1 Mac mini does run the latest version of the Hugging Face API, but we didn't use the Hugging Face API. But uh, yeah, I guess we did. So we imported Transformers. So Transformers is working under the hood. So that was the example, super simple, but I will say there was one thing I forgot to mention, which is that in this lora.py file, I went through like a dozen different sets of hyperparameters to try to get this thing working, which is just the reality of machine learning. Machine learning is much more art than science, or at least for now. But I did want to point out one thing that I had to do. So I had to go in here and kind of hack one set of hyperparameters. Okay. Okay, here. So adjusting the rank of these LoRa adapters is not something that this LoRa.py file exposes as a command line argument. So you can't just say, oh, I want to try rank four or rank eight or rank 16 or whatever from the command line. I had to go in to the file and just manually change it. I think it was eight originally, and I changed it to four. And this improved the training performance. Uh, before I did this, it was just kept overfitting. And I tried a lot of different sets of hyperparameters but reducing the rank worked a lot better. And this aligns with the results from the LoRa paper if you've taken a look at, and if you haven't, check it out. It's a really good read. Rank four, rank eight seem to be that sweet spot for the results. I guess I can pull it up real quick. So in table six of the LoRa paper, you can see they were comparing what weights they were applying the adapters to and the different ranks of the adapters. In the QLAR example on Google Colab, I just applied fine tuning to the query layer using rank eight. But in this example, I applied it to both the query and the value layers, and I used rank four. And you can see that at least in these examples, the rank four, rank eight is kind of like this inflection point in the performance. Like it kind of flattens out and actually starts to get a little worse as the rank gets too big. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this walkthrough. The example code is again, freely available on the GitHub repository shown here, and I'll link it in the description below. If you enjoyed this video or you have suggestions for future your content, please let me know in the comment section below. And as always, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.